So I've got the Super Deluxe, Meg Neg, standard can. I've been back and forth with this with the Banshee. Now, Meg Neg's definitely the go for a couple of reasons. I think obviously the larger negative air chamber helps you uh, with tuning, suppleness, and entire stroke support. So it makes the entire stroke a little bit stronger uh, relative to the size you end up with and also the style of frame you put it on. So a certain style of frame will need almost an em empty can, so a huge negative chamber in order to uh, polish over the shortcomings or, or fill in gaps with the kinematics of the frame. And then other frames will need the can full of tokens plus some in order to get the most out of it and find that sweet spot, which is what I'm finding with this Banshee. So four tokens was as close as I got to ironing out that mid stroke, ironing out that, that really strong <laughs> under your feet, like the, the hits under your feet. Um, two bands is worse, no bands is way worse, three bands is a little better, four bands is better again. Still not quite there, swap the cans out and the standard can has a different characteristic entirely and doesn't quite, uh, at that ratio where you've got such a large positive and such a small negative, it doesn't make for a great feeling. So when you put the standard can Super Deluxe onto a bike with very little progression or, or you know, say 15% progression, um, that's not very little, that's, that's a good amount. Uh, but like very little, like a nine or 11%, whatnot. And you fill the positive up with tokens it brings the ratio of positive to negative much closer and it actually makes that shot perform exceptionally well. Really, really well with the standard can, four and a half tokens on a bike that's not super progressive, uh, like a you know, 12 to 15% I think is really, really good. My remedy, my old remedy, I think was 17%. Four and a half tokens was absolutely beautiful. Um, but when you've got such a odd ratio of uh, size difference, I think I think that is detrimental to performance, but I also think that the equalization point in the travel plays some sort of a part in either stroke strength and suppleness, or maybe just, I'm not too sure exactly, I can't isolate exactly what it does yet, but I think that the, so this, what I'm saying is this Magneg equalizes at 18% sag, nearly 20% sag. Whereas the standard can only equalizes at 10% sag. So they're equalizing at a completely different point. So the, the point where there's no uh, counteracting forces between the positive and the negative, so the negative isn't vacuuming down and the positive isn't you know, forcing out or whatever, um, is closer to your actual height that you're taking hits at with the magneg. So it's, it, it, I think it makes that suspension feel more free with that ten uh, with that twenty percent equal or eighteen percent equalization versus the ten percent equalization of the uh, of the other one, so it's always pulling you back. There's always a little bit of little bit of tug of war going on in the can. So I'm not sure. That's just my kind of instinctive thoughts of, of what I've felt and whatnot, and you know, congregating all my thoughts over the years of writing these things and testing them and whatever. So just a thought, but I think there's some merit to it. Absolutely. So Magneg, what I've done now is our last instalment when I was up at Death Track, I was just looking to just knock off the top of that mid stroke, just a little bit more. And I didn't, you know, in conventionally, I'd run out of tuning options. I'd already gone all four bands. But what I've done is pull the can off and I've smeared a heap of grease on those rubber bands to the equivalent to probably another band. So the Magneg, is the Magneg full of bands is 67% larger, so full of bands, so the, in, in its smallest configuration, 67% larger than the standard can's negative size. So four bands, still 67% larger. Three bands is 78% uh, or 77%, whatever. Uh, two bands is 88%. Three bands is 99%. Uh, sorry, one band is 99% and no bands is, is at 111%. So huge, quite a bit bigger, and, and great tuning options, perfect, just killer. I love this magnet. So what I've done is smeared the equivalent to another band 
which is it's that's definitely subjective. I didn't weigh it and measure it and and work out the volume and whatever. I just put what it looks like. You know, I used my uh, my logic to work out what was about right. I smeared it on, and then when you put the can on, when you put the neg back on, if you're wiggling it, if if you wiggle it back and forth, like like spin it back and forth, and pull it down and put it up, you'll get some of that. Uh, grease into the can instead of just pushing it on and all the grease you put on just ends up coming out the top here so uh, you can either do it that way or you can pull the can complete if it's on the bike or you can pull the can completely off and smear that amount of grease on the inner wall of that can don't worry about it clogging the ports there's i think there's four or five ports all the way around there in this neg so it's definitely not going to clog the ports and it only needs to be that those ports only need to be exposed for during the equalization uh, process when you're setting the bike up. During the during the actual riding, that it doesn't pay any. It doesn't. I don't think it plays a part. I'm not 100 percent sure. I could be corrected, but I don't think the it keeps equalizing. It stays where it is more or less. Um, it does kind of calibrate itself when it goes past on the slower hits for sure, and and re equalizes to a point, but not much. But anyway. I did that and it definitely made it better. I got a lap at Moriata and it felt like I could just charge the back end over stuff instead of it going ding, 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 a little bit over the really choppier stuff and especially the slower speed choppier stuff. So it's taken that little bit of extra support away for me that I was looking to get rid of. Hopefully keeping the rest of the stroke the same. It felt killer. It felt, But that was only Moriata and it's very deceptive because it's not uh, very representative of trails that I ride. So Waterfall Gully, for instance, a setup that's the fastest setup at Moriata will feel garbage at Waterfall Gully because the speeds are slower, uh, the angles are different, there's a little bit more steep steepness, and uh, I can't generate the same force coming into bumps because of the speed and because of the style of trail. So completely different setup. So the Moriata setup isn't a great indicator, but it's a good start. So I can alter what I've got to suit the other trails and see where, see where it goes. What I'm getting at is that's what I'm doing today and tomorrow. So I've been working, I'm back at work, slaving away, and uh, that's obviously, that's why I've run out of time a little bit, but this weekend is gonna be this, making sure this is good, and once I find that sweet spot of this, which I'm pretty sure I'm on, I'm pretty sure I'm on, but I'll test it on a couple of tracks today, or a track that's more conducive of what I ride, like we'll go, probably go back to death track, same sections, see how it feels. Shout out to Dave. Dave sent me this from Sydney. Uh, had it on his bike. Wasn't really getting on with it. Um, uh, felt like it was bottoming out or whatever. I think maybe he just had a really light high speed compression tune. So I've had this bike on, I've had this shot on the bike for a bit uh, just for car park setup and, and feeling how it feels and seeing where my. Uh, where my ride height is for a spring and whatnot. So I've got an Olin 343 spring on it. Uh, same internal diameter as the Cane Creek spring. So it works, no worries, that's fine. Uh, maybe a little bit stiff for me. It might be just a touch stiff. So we'll see. But I think, I think it'll be okay. Um, but I want to test this. I want to see how this goes. I've, I had a shot on these shocks a little while ago. Also, this... Uh, Getting sidetracked. Uh, hardware. NS Dynamics did this hardware for me. Killer. It is so good. It's got a little rubber. So you've got the little rubber that goes up against the body of the shot. Then you've got a free washer that goes up against the rubber. And then you've got this smaller washer that has a rubber inside it. So nothing goes off. So nothing comes off. It can't come loose. But it just sits there nice and snug. I love it. I think this is a killer setup. So spot on. 25 bucks. You know, good price spot on NS Dynamics. Um, but anyway, I wanted to test this shot again because I got the Kitsuma. This is the Cane Creek Kitsuma. So full finger dials, killer tunability, the best in the business for tunability, I think. Um, for a you know, pull off to the side of the track, no, I'm gonna change that. You literally just turn it with your fingers. There's no tools, there's no nothing, it's killer. So there's no hard to reach spots, uh, love it. But my problem with it was I got one for the track and it was topping out. So I got another one. Uh, they swapped it out because it was topping out and it was exactly the same. So uh, Dave got 
in contact with me said he doesn't think this one tops out. I put it on the bike, definitely tops out. It's exactly the same. It's the same clunk, clunk, clunk. It's just got no deceleration of the force at full extension. Now, what I'm thinking over all this time, so the two dBs that I had, this dB, the Olin's, this sucker here, twin, all twin tube designs, I'm thinking that maybe this topping out is an inherent uh, characteristic of the twin tube design. Maybe they just can't, they don't have anywhere to, to implement a bottom out, uh, uh, sorry, a top out um, decelerator or whatever, like something that, to stop that force before it gets to the top, before it gets clunk, clunk. It's like it's hollow at the top. It's, they're just, they're all the same. So, not really impressed with that. But now that I know that they all do it, or I'm assuming they all do it, now that I've had four different shots uh, of a similar style, and they all do the exact same thing, um, it must just be part of that design. Uh, the DHX2 kind of does it a tiny bit, but it's very faint. It's faint versus any versus either of these. So um, I really want to test this again. That's not a deal killer for me this time around. It was last time. Now it's more of a you just got to accept it and uh, ignore it and see if there's performance there outside of it. The tuning on this shock is so good. So just car parking, just car park testing, absolutely noticeable high speed compression range, absolutely noticeable low speed compression range, absolutely noticeable low speed rebound range an absolutely noticeable high speed rebound range. So no compression, full open on the compression is full open, like there's no compression damping. So you absolutely will need to run some compression damping. If you're oversprung, you'll find that, oh, I need to run, you know, run it more open, whatever. But you don't wanna be running just spring force. You wanna be spring, spring dominant, but you need compression control. You don't wanna be too light on the spring and leaning on your compression because you'll constantly be blowing your compression stacks and blowing your seals. So you need to be spring dominant, but you need to share some load with compression. Uh, basic, but yeah, that's what I'm doing today and tomorrow. We're testing these suckers. I'm pretty sure I've got this Super Deluxe absolutely singing now. Shit, supple as hell, like I was talking about the other week about you can definitely set up an air shock to be as supple as a coil. They're just not consistent. That's, that's the difference. I think I've got this thing to where I want it. So where I would be able to get most coil shocks. So, let's see.